I was tired, should have been sleeping, I guess. My name's Mark Glassman, I'm the Artistic Director of This Is Not Reading series, and I'm here with Victoria Zakheim, uh, the editor of He Said What. And Victoria, I was wondering, it's such a great concept, when did it come to you and how did the book evolve? I was probably with a group of friends and I heard somebody say, he said what? And I thought, as an anthologist, now that's an interesting idea. With He Said What, it was, it was actually quite easy because I went to about 30 authors and said, this is my idea, what do you think? And within, I would say, 48 hours, I had all the authors for the book. Ten and a Half Stories is something that's been going on now, a group that's been going on now for a year, and they do uh, improvised stories. And uh, in this case, the challenge was to come up with stories to go along with the theme of He Said What. So, I'm five years old. My dad picks me up at my Montessori school and we drive all the way across the entirety of the United States and when we get to California, we move into an apartment. My dad does this because he thinks that I have one competent parent and one parent who is fit to raise me and it is him. And I grow up knowing that my mother has been diagnosed with schizophrenia and that she has spent time in various mental hospitals. When my son was five, I went to my mom's house to pick him up after work. And he got in the car and I said, hey, what'd you guys do today? And he said, Granny and I, we went to the creek and we found a grasshopper and we ate it. It was alive in my mouth. And I laughed and laugh, and laugh. Because my mother was never going to be the bake cookies, wear an apron, keep a meticulously friendly, you know, clean house, walk down the street with your clothes on. She was never going to be that woman. But I feel so profoundly grateful that I was lucky enough to be born to such a smart, warm, funny person who was the sanest person I ever met. Avril Benoit, of course, is, um, it's, I think it's fair to say, a, a beloved uh, broadcaster and journalist, someone who uh, contributed greatly to the airwaves and thoughts of this country for a couple of decades, and has now fled to more interesting uh, circles perhaps going international with Doctors Without Borders as a communication director. And it's great to get Avril out here to do what she has done so well over the years, which is to ask people questions and to elicit answers and to give her own opinions. So please welcome to the stage Avril Benoit. So the guy is rich and he's gorgeous. And I'd always thought he was kind of hot, really. Sculptor, but rich. <laughs> and he spends all night uh, over dinner uh, just really vapid. It was the first time I'd ever hear him speak. And it was one story after another about dating these gorgeous women in LA and Milan and so on. And at the end of the night, I realized we really had nothing in common. And I said, why, wh why did you ask me out? <laughs> and he said, well, I wanted to know what it was like to date somebody who wasn't a model. <laughs> you know, why do I remember that? Why, th what a stupid thing. And yet it was the kind of story that I just kind of reveled in because it was so absurd. And I like to think that in this book, you have many of those stories that for one reason or another, they just stick. So please welcome them up, Diane Reinhardt and Victoria Zakhan. Now, before we hear Diane's story, uh, Victoria, can you explain why you chose this one to lead off the, the anthology? I chose Diane's essay to start this book. Her essay epitomized what this book was all about because not only did she go into something that was historical that I found very interesting about the women's conference in Beijing, but she also talked about her personal life and a true he said what experience. So she managed to take the whole assignment, if you will, and encapsulate it into a really wonderful essay. The essay is set at the Beijing Conference for Women, uh, which was a 
really a groundbreaking experience for uh, the women's movement at that moment. Could you tell us <laughs> what, it, what, it, what it was like to try to focus on the big picture, and yet you needed to pay attention to the domestic situation uh, that was unfolding back home? Yeah. Every day there's women from all over the world and they've, you know, some of their villages got together and provided funds for them to get to the event in Beijing and they really wanted to fight for women's rights and they were being uh, prevented from fighting for women's rights, which the whole UN conference was about, by the Chinese authorities. So they hid them away in a place that was 45 minutes away from Beijing in, in a place called Wairo where a bunch of reporters were covering it. You know, the Chinese authorities are making it impossible for you to get there. And meanwhile, in the back of my head, as I'm trying to fight to do my job and, and fight to get this message out, and this is really important, and, and this could really be earth-changing for women, um, in the back of my mind is this little kind of niggling thing like, where is my husband? <laughs> Why isn't he answering the phone? Do I think he's with her? <laughs> so, yeah, it was, yeah, I felt guilty. <laughs> I think that there's a lot of that looking back and thinking, what if I had done it this way? You know, if only I had done it that way. But it doesn't negate the, the drama and sometimes the trauma of that he said what experience. Oh, you can blame it on a beautiful stranger. He was perfect when you met. Oh, up came the inevitable dangers you're afraid to even bet. Rolling, yeah, right out of gas when you shouldn't have been driving. You shouldn't have been leaning. Let it take you where you get.